All right, hello everyone. Um, so today I thought we would talk a little bit about conservation genomics and some concepts that are used in conservation genomics. Like yesterday, please feel free to interrupt if you have questions at any point. Okay, so um, as you all maybe already know, we are currently in the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is a proposed new geological epoch during which human activity is the dominant influence on both cli on climate and the environment. And one of the major <clears throat> consequences of the Anthropocene is widespread population declines in species worldwide. So in May 2019, the United Nations Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services completed a very comprehensive assessment of biodiversity um, and ecosystem services. And they found that about 1 million or one in four species worldwide right now are at risk of extinction. So here on the slide, you can see um, the breakdown by group. So about 40% of amphibians are at risk of extinction, 35% of mammals, 14% of birds, um, et cetera. So there are five kind of major drivers of extinction and um, population declines, habitat degradation, exploitation, invasive species and disease, pollution, and climate change. Um, and the same report also looked at the proportion of species affected by each of these five key drivers um, for four major groups of animals. So birds, reptiles, and amphibians, mammals, and fish. For terrestrial animals, the largest threat is habitat loss and fragmentation, whereas for fishes, the primary threat is exploitation. So given all of these challenges, it's really important for us um, as scientists to be able to understand how to both assess populations and um, also think about ways that we can conserve and manage declining populations. So population genetic theory has actually played a large role um, in conservation biology. And there's several frameworks. So there's a conservation genetics paradigm that talks about kind of population genetic effects of declining populations. And there's also this concept of the extinction vortex, um, which has proven to be a fairly informative model when you're trying to think about kind of all of the different interacting forces behind the dynamics of biodiversity loss. Um, and population decline. So the extinction vortex describes the scenario in which environmental, genetic, and demographic forces interact through time to push a population towards extinction. So there's this feedback cycle, right? So the, the different um, kind of anthropogenic drivers of population decline increase demographic stochasticity, environmental stochasticity, and can cause catastrophes. These lead to smaller, more, frag, uh, more isolated populations, which um, based on population genetic theory are predicted to have smaller population size, or they have smaller distributions, smaller population sizes, and smaller effective population sizes. And population genetic theory predicts that this, these small isolated populations should experience um, increased genetic drift um, and increased inbreeding and lower genetic diversity, which in turn is predicted um, to decrease a uh, population's ability to adapt to new situations and also have a decreased fitness. So decreased survival and reproduction, decreased population growth rates. And these then kind of feed back to uh, making a population less able to cope with stochasticity and catastrophes. So the field of conservation genetics, now a newer field of conservation genomics, uses genetic and genomic tools to answer conservation-related questions. Um, so both to try to understand kind of the health, um, I guess, of populations, as well, and also to use these tools to help inform management strategies. So kind of primary questions in conservation genetics is characterized by trying to understand relationships between population size and neutral sequence variation. Um, and a big assumption in, in conservation genetics is that kind of 
neutral marker variation is a good proxy for adaptive variation, levels of adaptive variation. Um, but now with the advent of kind of next generation sequencing and our ability to go out and do genomics in natural populations, including populations of threatened species, um, we now have a greater ability to look at relationships between population size. Um, well, we have the ability to look for kind of adaptive variation and then look at how kind of dynamics of neutral and adaptive variation are influenced by fragmentation, decreased population size, et cetera. Um, so this figure here shows a lot of the different concepts, right, that are addressed in conservation, gen traditional conservation genetics in blue and then conservation genomics um, provides a wider range of questions and those are shown in red. So I know that um, you all should have learned a little bit about kind of genetic drift and population structure. Um, yesterday, we talked a lot about inbreeding and inbreeding depression. So I thought today we would um, cover kind of three different topics um, that are kind of exciting areas in conservation genomics today. So using genomics to infer population demography, um, kind of methods for identifying adaptive genetic variation, um, and then, oh, I guess really I'm talking about one method, and then informing um, genetic rescue, talking about genetic rescue, what that is, and what are some of the pitfalls. Um, so let's start with demography. So um, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, a quick definition, population demography is essentially a characterization of effective population sizes back in time, so looking for expansions, bottlenecks, et cetera. Um, as well as population structure and migration rates over time, right? And there are many different reasons for wanting to model demographic history. So one, we may have like an intrinsic interest in understanding the history of the populations we're studying. Um, it's also important to have an understanding of demography um, because that provides the appropriate neutral model if you're interested in testing for selection. Because um, oftentimes, you know, forces such as stress and gene flow can produce signatures or patterns of genetic variation that are consistent with um, patterns of genetic variation produced by selection. And so it's really important to understand um, the demographic history of the populations you're studying. And also for conservation purposes, um, it's good to know both present and historical levels of genetic diversity in a population as that can really kind of inform your efforts and the urgency of the situation. So there are many different methods for um, performing demographic inference. And um, a lot of them are summarized in this review paper, which I will put in Slack um, later today. So, uh, in this review paper, they made this kind of nice flow chart on trying to think about kind of what are the different types of methods that you would want to use. Um, and the choice of method really depends on the time period that you're interested in. So are you interested so um, in recent events, so within the last hundred to thousand generations in a population, that's typically the time scale that's most relevant for conservation. Um, or are you interested in more like ancient events that are happening in much deeper time? Um, other factors that are important to consider include the type of sequence data that you have available. Do you have whole genome data? Do you have reduced uh, representation data? Um, or do you have smaller numbers of markers? Um, and also the sample size. So how many individuals have you managed to um, genotype? So what I'm gonna do now, instead of giving diving into these different methods, I'll just give you some really brief, brief conceptual background for um, these different types of methods. Uh, yesterday, we talked uh, about identical by descent and ident IBD tracts. Um, there are a whole suite of methods now that can use the distribution of identity by descent tracts um, to infer demographic history. Um, another thing to think about too is when you're trying to reconstruct demographic history from genomic data. So remember from yesterday, right? 
our genomes are inherited. Um, we inherit like half our genomes from mom and dad, and the, we inherit genomes in chunks that are broken up by recombination. And so because of this process, if you're scanning across the genome, different regions of the genome, um, there's some randomness in like which haplotypes you're inheriting. Um, so you can have different gene trees for different regions of the genome. Demography is expected to affect the entire genome. Uh, whereas natural selection is expected to act on very specific functional reasons. So there's a whole suite of kind of like selection scans that are based on kind of looking for regions of the genome that look different from others. Um, so one, there are a lot of different methods that use the site frequency spectrum. So demographic events influence the shape and structure of these gene trees, these genealogies. Um, which in turn then influences patterns of genetic variation. And one really commonly used summary of genetic variation in a population is the site frequency spectrum. So many popular methods leverage the site frequency spectrum for inferring population dem uh, demographic history. And here I'm showing you a um, figure from a review paper that looks at, that basically shows you four simple population demographic models um, a constant model, a bottleneck model, an expansion model, and a structured population model, so a model with a split. Um, below each model um, is shown in the middle row is the average gene genealogies um, from kind of five different lineages produced from coalescent simulations. And then uh, the very bottom row shows you like an example site frequency spectrum. Um, excuse me, generated from each of these models. So the red line here is the site frequency spectrum from the constant um, population model on every plot. And then so you can see kind of how different demographic events kind of um, change the site frequency spectrum compared to a constant model. Um, so in general, kind of methods that use the site frequency spectrum to infer demographic history, take your genomic data, and then you compute the observed site frequency spectrum. Um, and a lot of likelihood-based approaches basically then compute the likelihood of your data based on the expected site frequency spectrum under a given model, right? Um, so there are different ways of obtaining the expected site frequency spectrum. So you can use kind of diffusion models where you're simulating forward in time or coalescent models where you're trying, you're kind of working backward in time um, in order to generate your SFS. And so typically uh, what this, these model-based inference methods basically start with a defined demographic scenario um, and then you have a number of demographic parameters, such as the time of timing of population splits, migration rates uh, between populations and effective sizes of different populations over time. Um, and you can estimate these demographic parameters using a likelihood-based approach. So there's a whole other, um, so the site frequency spectrum-based models um, off not all of them consider linkage between sites, but we know that right, the genome is inherited in chunks broken up by recombination. And what this basically means is that you'll have correlated genealogies as you move across the genome um, until you hit a recombination event. And there's a, a whole suite of methods that use this information, right? So since you have correlated genealogies across the genome, what this means is um, you can have segments with a fixed uh, time since the most recent common ancestor or TMRCA that are separated by recombination events. Um, and these, their methods uh, kind of called the pairwise sequentially Markovian coalescent um, that rely on this pattern in order to perform demographic inference. So PSMC, um, what this method essentially does is it infers the time to the TMRCA, the most recent common ancestor, on the using kind of the local density of heterozygotes in a given region. Um, 
And it's based on a hidden Markov model in which the observation is your a diploid sequence. So you have, you know, if you have a whole genome um, sequence for a particular individual you're reading across the genome, um, the hidden states are these discretized TMRCAs um, and transitions essentially represent these ancestral um, recombination events. Um, and the assumption here is that when recombination, when you hit a recombination event, um, the genealogy to the right of the recombination event only depends on the genealogy to the left of the recombination event. So here is the bottom is a graph kind of showing the uh, performance of this method from kind of the original paper, Lee and Durbin, that described um, the PRMC, PSMC method. Um, so here they use software to simulate um, the TMRCA for a given individual across the 200 KB region. Um, and the simulated true value is shown in the thick red line. Um, and then the heat map behind it is the inferred local TMRCA using this PSMC method. And so you can see that um, the inference does pretty well. Uh, and you see the most errors show up at transition points. Um, so this method has become fairly popular. So there's a, a suite of related methods. So there's PSMC, um, which uses one kind of dip, one individual to perform demographic inference. Um, the problem is with just one individual, you don't have very good resolution at more recent time scales. Um, and so there've been a suite of additional methods such as uh, MSMC and SMC++ that uh, allow you to use multiple individuals. Um, and SMC++ actually combines this PSMC with a uh, site frequency spectrum based inference in order to allow you to uh, infer demography over recent time scales more accurately. Um, but these methods have become increasingly popular because, you know, for PSMC, you really just need a sample size of one uh, individual. You just need a high quality genome sequence and you can get some information about demographic history. The um, kind of gold standard, I think, nowadays is the ancestral recombination graph. So the ancestral recombination graph essentially is the most complete description of a population that you can produce. Um, it describes how all the individual sequences in the population are related um, and provides this combined history of recombination, mutation, and coalescence. So there's one kind of, there's a true ancestral recombination graph underlying any um, sample of sequences. Um, and this uh, figure here basically shows a schematic of an ARG, right? So on the very bottom part C are kind of sequence data um, showing derived uh, SNPs. And then A and B are simply two different depictions of the ARG where you can kind of trace, you have your four samples and you can trace lineages going um, backwards in time, moving up. Um, and lineages merge when there's a coalescence event. And you can also see alternatives, um, dotted lines show recombination events uh, that kind of transform one tree to another. This is a computationally difficult um, thing to infer, although now there's um, more programs, so it's possible to infer the ancestral recombination graph from sequence data. And there's a lot of powerful inferences that you can make using the ancestral recombination graph. Um, so both about selection and demography. Yes, Deepa. Um, maybe you said this and I missed it, but do you use these um, this method for inferring histories or across populations, or is it used usually for a single population? Are there assumptions that violate the use of these models? Um, that's a good idea, a good question. I believe you can use it 
for across populations. Okay. Um, the primary constraint right now for ARGs is sample size. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's just hard to, um, yeah, but I'm pretty sure that there are folks using ARGs to like look at hybridization mm -hmm. to, to kind of cell populations. So right. I mean, like if you have closely related populations of a species, um, I guess my question is then, can you use this to infer recent um, shared history or ancestry across these populations? Um, yeah. I mean, this is a totally selfish question. This is what we're thinking about, <laughs> oh. <laughs> this, which is why I'm like, huh, I have not seen this method. Let me, I need to think about this. But anyway, okay, cool. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I can send, I can send you papers if you want. It's, I mean, this is just like the most complete history Mm -hmm. Like if you had more, um, oh my God, what, I'm, what did I want to say? If you have kind of divergent sequences, right? If you're sampling mm -hmm. two populations that are not that closely related, like you would still have an ancestral recombination graph, just the coalescence events would be deeper in time, right? Right, right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to end the section with a fun recent example. Um, so this paper came out in 20, I, I was going to say earlier this year until I realized it's now 2022. 2021 was last year. This paper came out last year where they sequenced um, a, some number of genomes of the California condor, which is this classic um, species that almost went extinct because of DBT, um, the Andean condor and the turkey vulture. Um, they used a number of different methods based on the sequentially Markovian coalescent um, in order to infer affected population sizes through time. And so here I'm showing you a figure where um, they're plotting the inferred population size trajectories for California condors in red and orange, the Andean condor in blue, and the turkey vulture in green. Um, for those of you who don't know, the turkey vulture is this. So Andean condors, I think, are not super common. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think they're as threatened as the California condor, but I could be wrong. Um, whereas turkey vultures are like super widespread everywhere. You, you, um, so it's a very, and they have really large uh, current day population sizes. So kind of the surprising finding from this paper was that one, there's pretty clear evidence of historical population declines in all three species. Um, and uh, they also, this result also suggests that California condors actually were way more abundant than Andean condors or turkey vultures um, a long time ago. So like in the Pleistocene. So that kind of puts an interesting perspective on kind of dynamics of um, the California condor through time and really emphasizes that the current decline was uh, a lot greater. Um, cause I think one of the expectations was that California condors had always been in low population sizes, uh, through time and using genomics, they've shown that that's clearly not the case. Okay. Any questions so far? All right, I'll move on. Um, so now totally shifting gears. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about some ways for identifying adaptive genetic variation. So one common way is looking, kind of scanning the genome for signatures of selection. Um, I'm not talking about that because I'm guessing maybe that you've um, covered those topics already. So instead, I thought I would provide just a very basic introduction to quantitative genetics. Um, so uh, hopefully you all know that phenotypes um, here represented by P are determined by both genetic and environmental factors. And many, many phenotypes are polygenic or controlled by multiple genes. And these traits tend to be controlled by multiple genes of small effects. 
Um, and a classic kind of polygenic trait is human height, where you have this nice continuous distribution. And we know um, that there are several hundred, if not more, um, genes that contribute to variation in human height. So the whole field of quantitative genetics, right, is interested in trying to understand what underlies phenotypic variation among individuals. Um, so the phenotypic variants BP um, can be decomposed into genetic variants, BG, and also environmental variants. And you can further partition genetic variation um, into the genetic variants into three separate components. Um, so the additive genetic variants, uh, dominance variants, and also epistatic variants. And so there have been a lot of folks who have been interested in this concept of heritability. So heritability is the genetic contribution to phenotypic variants. And the, um, there's both narrow sense and broad sense heritability. Most folks are interested in narrow sense heritability, which is the kind of proportion of phenotypic variants that's due to additive genetic variation. Um, and this measure is of int interest to kind of all sorts of folks because heritability, kind of the additive genetic variance for a trait is what underlies the predicted response to selection. One thing to keep in mind is that um, phenotypic variance, right, has an environmental component. So because environments, uh, so kind of these variance components measures or and estimates of the heritability of heritability are all population specific measures. So one kind of um, important concept in conservation genomics is trying to identify the adaptive potential of a population. Um, and one definition of adaptive potential is that additive the genetic variation that's needed to respond to selection. So in other words, what is the additive genetic variance? for um, fitness by itself, if you can actually quantify fitness well, or for fitness, fitness related traits. So this is notoriously hard to measure because one, it's um, difficult to quantify fitness in natural populations, although it's getting um, a little bit more doable. And also if you're interested in um, like some fitness related traits like lifetime reproductive success have these uh, really, difficult distributions to model well, like a zero inflated Poisson or something. So, but there's a lot more work now being done and you can use these kind of linear mixed models um, that are called animal models because they were first developed by animal breeders um, where you can essentially partition phenotypic variants in natural populations and try to estimate the adogenic variants for traits such as survival and fecundity. Um, and that gives you a little bit more information on adaptive potential. So I think a big assumption uh, in conservation genetics traditionally was that you know, small populations are at risk because they have lower genetic variation and lower adaptive potential. Um, but there actually aren't that many studies out there who have actually quantified um, like really carefully quantified the adaptive potential of the population. Um, but I think that's changing now with kind of the advent of more uh, genetic data and also um, more kind of long-term studies of pedigree data where you can actually uh, measure fitness. So um, heritability is also kind of interesting to non-conservation biologists and a lot of folks have spend a lot of time trying to estimate heritabilities of various different traits and various different species. Um, here's a figure from a review paper looking at um, summarizing kind of reported heritability measures for a number of morphological traits and for a, a various taxa and fitness traits. Most traits have a heritability of like between 0.1 and 0.9. And one really common pattern that we've seen um, so far is that fitness related traits tend to have um, lower heritability than say morphological traits. So um, a lot of folks, heritability is kind of a useful concept for kind of 
predicting responses to selection and whatnot, but it doesn't actually tell you very much about the underlying genetic architecture, right? So you know how much of a particular trait is governed by um, additive genetic variation, but you have no idea how many genes there are underlying the trait or where those um, loci are kind of located across the genome. And this is of interest, right? So one, this is another way of trying to identify adaptive genetic variation. You can do a selection scan to look for kind of regions of the genome under selection, or you can uh, do a genome-wide association study to try to detect associations between um, allele frequency at a particular region in the genome and a fitness related trait or whatever trait that you're interested in. Um, so the basic idea underlying a genome-wide association study is you have a, your study population, so either cases and controls, if you're interested in a, in a like binary trait, um, or an unselected population sample for a given trait. There are also a lot of methods being developed now that kind of take into account fan, that use family-based designs. So if you have um, phenotypic measures for individuals that are related on a pedigree, you can also use that information to do your association. Um, so then you kind of genotype everybody in your population that you can and um, use linear models to test for an association between your phenotype um, and your genotype. So um, some things that you want to keep in mind here is that you typically causal variants are not directly genotyped, um, but the hits that you might pick up in a genome-wide association study will be variants that are in linkage disequilibrium with um, a causal variant. Yes, Amir. Uh, I, I just had a question in the previous slide. Uh, why why is fitness why are fitness related traits uh, less heritable? I understand there'll be um, less variation, but why are they less heritable? I don't get that. Why are fitness related traits less heritable? Um, that's a good question. So I think the general idea here, right, is that fitness related traits should be um, are going to be under selection. And the and selection is essentially adding is, um, so let's just assume for instance, for now that we uh, have a trait under directional selection, right? Like clutch or never mind, or calving success, for instance, like the higher your calving success, the better. Um, selection is gonna operate to remove variation, right? Because Ideally, um, if calving success is very, very uh, tied to fitness and under strong selection, eventually everybody, like assuming there are no other opposing factors, right, will have very high calving success. And so as you remove phenotypic variation in a trait, the additive genetic variance for a trait um, under selection over time also goes to zero. Because like at some point you just have no variation left in that trait if kind of selection has gone to completion. I mean, of course, this doesn't actually happen because there are many other forces um, that will prevent a trait from becoming fixed in a population. Um, but that's, I think, one of the reasons why you see lower heritabilities for fitness-related traits. Does that answer your question? Uh, so basically, additive genetic variation drops quite a bit, but the other two don't, uh, the epistatic and uh, dominant uh, variations. They don't drop as much, is what you're saying? Um, I'm not actually sure how dominance and epistatic variation change. Um, I think those two are much, they're harder to estimate and less well studied. Um, but I think also like there is going to be less genetic variation for a trait under strong selection too, right? 
over time because you're selecting for like the same beneficial haplotype. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any Thanks. other questions? Um, okay, so genome wide association studies, this is the kind of general model. Um, these tests are used to identify regions of the genome associated with a phenotype of interest at genome wide significance. Um, problems with genome wide association studies is typically you need really, really large sample sizes to get accurate estimates of small effect sizes. Um, and there are also a lot of studies now that are just throwing out, like, they're no longer using, they're using GBLAS and like fitting these models to get ab, uh, effect sizes for all of the SNPs across the genome, but instead of trying to look for hits that are past like multiple testing criterion, um, they use these effect sizes and combine them to try to estimate uh, and predict what the phenotype should be, um, although there's a lot of caveats to all of those methods because again, something to keep in mind here is that, you know, these effect sizes are going to be population specific because kind of the environment can play a really important role um, in phenotypic variants. So another thing too is that the feasibility of identifying kind of genetic variants and really characterizing the genetic architecture of a trait um, depends, um, or sorry, the genetic architecture of a trait really uh, determines your the feasibility of actually identifying uh, regions of the genome that are associated with that given trait. Um, and it's also dependent on kind of the allele frequency of the causal alleles and the strength of the um, effect, so the effect size. So on this graph here, I'm showing kind of allele frequency on the x-axis and uh, effect size on the y-axis. Um, it's very, very hard to actually um, identify rare variants with small effects. Um, there's a few examples of being able of like high, large effect common variants. Um, for most genome-wide association studies, you'll have um, the most power to detect kind of uh, common, common variants or like intermediate uh, uh, effect variants with like low to high frequency. Um, things that are very rare with large effects can be detectable. They're more likely to be detectable um, if you have a family-based design. So a lot of work, there's a lot of, like this is becoming increasingly used in kind of conservation genetics to try to identify regions of the genome that are associated with fitness-related traits. So I think the idea there is maybe you can use that information um, to inform management practices, such as if you're doing kind of assist, like translocations, of individuals bringing in individuals who you know have alleles that are um, associated with high survival or high fitness or, um, or with like tolerance to different climates. Uh, one really fun example of kind of a important conservation story and for which we've learned a little bit about the genetic architecture of the trait is um, for devil facial tumor disease. So devil facial tumor disease is this infectious cancer um, that showed up, I think, in 19, in the mid, like 1990, late 1990s. Um, and it's 
uh, transmissible by biting and um, Tasmanian devils bite each other a lot. Um, and it spread really rapidly across Tasmania and caused upwards of like 95% population declines. Um, and I think the total population of uh, Tasmanian devils has been reduced by 75 to 80%. Um, and I think many folks worry that this kind of transmissible cancer would cause the Tasmanian devils to go extinct fairly soon. Um, but in fact, there's been some evidence that there is a little bit of, there is some, it seems like there is some evolution of resistance and or tolerance to this, um, to the uh, DFTD or double facial tumor disease. And so a study in 2018 um, genotyped like 600 uh, Tasmanian devils, uh, 6,600 loci across the genome um, and used genome-wide association studies to um, kind of assess the heritability of three different cancer-related phenotypes. So they looked at age at infection, uh, at first infection, um, they also compared infected devils with devils that never were never infected, so case control. Um, and they also uh, looked at survival following infection. And it was pretty remarkable that the kind of the 16,000 loci that they um, genotyped actually managed to explain quite a bit of the phenotypic variance for female survival. So they did the analysis in males and females separately. They were able to explain about 80% of the phenotypic variance for female survival using their um, genotypes, and like more than half of um, uh, in infections in females, so whether or not a given uh, female got infected. And in fact, they uh, identified a few large effect SNPs um, that explained a lot of the variance. So I think the total um, amount of phenotypic variance explained by all the SNPs was 60 or was 80%. And then they found about five SNPs that explained kind of 61% of the total variance. Um, it was also interesting to find like there was, there are kind of large differences between males and females for survival after infection and whether the case control, whether or not they got infected. Um, so it seems like the genetic basis or, or and or selection on these traits um, is different between the two sexes. So some of the uh, markers that they picked up in their genome-wide association study are involved in cell adhesion and cell cycle regulation. Um, which kind of gives evidence that the immune system of the Tasmanian devils is um, maybe responding uh, and um, recognizing or suppressing the cancer using these kind of more basic cellular pathways. Um, kind of these types of studies are also gonna be uh, of more interest because there's currently a really a big debate um, on the role of neutral genetic diversity in conservation. So there were, there have been a number of different respective pieces published in PNAS over the past year. Um, some folks argue that neutral genetic diversity doesn't matter at all, and we should only focus on adaptive variation. Um, whereas others uh, are strongly arguing that actually it's genome-wide genetic variation is still really important and plays a very important role in conservation genetics. So I encourage you to check out these papers um, if you're interested. Any questions? Um, I remember a few years ago, there was, um, I remember seeing a meta-analysis uh, trying to correlate the levels of neutral genetic diversity with either known adaptive variation uh, for some, sort of populations of conservation interest or um, asking whether the neutral genetic diversity was a good predictor of um, rescue, um, evolutionary rescue or population 
um, health over time or something like that. Um, but but that was like, I don't know, 15 years ago. That I, do you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are better analyses like that. So um, what do those kinds of analyses show now that we have much better genome-wide data for so many species? Is that the primary argument of this first paper here, that, that there's no correlation and therefore all the correlations weak and therefore well, why bother with the neutral genetic diversity? I think we still don't have a good handle on the correlation between neutral genetic diversity and adaptive genetic diversity. Um, the first paper was using simulation models, uh, I believe, to, I, um, and we're just arguing that, you know, we really should be like, because I think it's mostly pointing out that, you know, that the conservation genetics paradigm for years and years has been, you know, the whole field was built on using neutral markers as proxies um, for adaptive genetic variation. So, um, but I think the problem is, is that we don't have a good understanding of what is adaptive in most populations still. Mm -hmm. um, like even if there is a general correlation between levels of neutral genetic diversity and adaptive genetic diversity, I think there's enough noise that you don't necessarily know mm -hmm. the answer for your particular species of interest. Um, and I think another fear is that you know, there's still a lot of useful information you can get from genome line markers, even if you don't know what which markers are neutral versus not. Um, and it's better to do something than nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, um, but I mean, I guess I'm not sure where's the argument for not using neutral genetic diversity coming in. I mean, I, I completely see what you're saying, but it's hard to know what is going to be adaptive, especially if our if the environment is going to change so much due to habitat loss, due to climate change, you know, fifty thousand other things that these species are going to face. Um, it seems like it would be very very difficult to sort of say that okay, let's ignore this neutral genetic diversity because we really don't know how neutral it is or how neutral it will turn out to be in the future, right? So, I guess I'm a little bit lost. What is the and then the practical aspect of saying well what what does one propose to do then, right? Given that you cannot possibly measure adaptive genetic variation in every context for every species that you want to conserve. Um, so, so yeah, I was wondering if there's updated data that say that that correlation is kind of really, really bad and therefore it should not be used because otherwise I don't see what is the logic of that first paper. Maybe I should just go read it, but yeah. Yeah, I'm going to admit that I haven't, um... I think I like read the abstract and it's on my to-do list, to-read list, and I haven't actually read it yet. <laughs> um, but it's caused a lot of fuss, I think, in the conservation uh, sure. genetics, yeah. <laughs> field, which is why I'm bringing it up. But I am embarrassed to admit in front of you all that I haven't actually read the full paper yet. <laughs> okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so um, for the last little section, sorry, I'm just doing like kind of broad overviews, but I think another kind of hot topic in conservation genetics right now that's a subject of a little bit of debate is kind of how useful is genetic rescue and can it as a management tool and can we actually kind of save a bunch of populations by translocating individuals? Um, so the idea here is that gene flow between populations has the potential to rescue populations from extinction. Um, and this could happen in two different ways. So first, the kind of probability of extinction for a population could go down simply due to the like numerical addition of more individuals into a population. Um, and this particular phenomenon is called demographic rescue. But if um, kind of the influx of immigrants also brings in new genetic variation, 
that leads to decreased levels of inbreeding and a subsequent increase in population growth, then um, that population has experienced genetic rescue. So essentially the difference between demographic rescue and genetic rescue is that success, successful genetic rescue should um, also increase genetic diversity, which could um, increase the population's ability to respond to selection and decrease inbreeding and in depression, et cetera, and increase the abundance of individuals, um, which if you have more individuals, there's more resilience to stochastic demographic effects, um, demographic stochasticity, and also decreases LA effects. Um, the positive effects of genetic rescue on population persistence can propagate um, to influence community processes by increasing individual niche partitioning um, and the potential for co-evolution, as well as by affecting predator-prey dynamics and um, kind of larger dispersal patterns. So the best known case of genetic rescue is the Florida panther. So Florida panthers used to be found throughout the southeastern United States, but are now restricted to shrinking habitat between kind of the cities of Miami and Naples and Florida. They were listed as federally endangered in 1967 when there were about 80 uh, individuals left in the entire subspecies. And scientists suspected that there was a lot of inbreeding depression because um, you often observed individuals with morphological or physiological defects, such as a kink tail, a cowlick, um, sperm defects, and heart defects. So in 1995, um, scientists translocated eight wild caught female uh, pumas from Texas into Florida. Um, and this translocate and then followed kind of populations over time. This translocation event resulted in increased abundance, increased heterozygosity, higher level, higher survival of hybrid individuals, and a reduced prevalence of phenotypic traits associated with inbreeding depression. So you can see here um, uh, how the increase in panther, the increase in panthers over time, as well as like the which um, kind of genotypes are increasing in the population over time, and also the change in heterozygosity in Florida panthers over time on the right. So this observed increase in both genetics and demography is makes a very clear example of genetic rescue. So the Florida panther is a textbook example of successful genetic rescue. Um, another important example, I think that maybe a reason why genetic rescue is, there's still a lot of questions about it, um, is uh, for Isle Royale wolves. Um, so there was a genetic rescue event of the Isle Royale wolf population because there was a single wolf who migrated to this island from the mainland um, in the late, I think, 1997. Um, so this male wolf, uh, which is actually uh, number 93 in this pedigree here, uh, was this very, very successful breeder. And in fact, he was too successful because within a, like a small number of generations, every individual in the Isle Royale population was related to that one male. Um, and here is the, I'm showing the pedigree of like two remaining wolves. Um, the shaded wolves, and you can see, like, based on the loops, that there's a lot of inbreeding, essentially because all of the wolves were the descendants of the same male, um, and that led to rampant inbreeding. Um, and this kind of rampant inbreeding, coupled with inbreeding depression, led to population decline, and now this population is actually almost to go extinct. Um, so this is a kind of example showing that, you know, the effects of genetic rescue can actually have a very temporary positive effect. Um, and in this particular case, it actually had a very strong negative effect um, later in time after the, uh, because of increasing kind of inbreeding after the immigration event. 
So genetic rescue is a currently very hotly debated management tool in conservation right now. Um, there are a few well-known examples of successful genetic rescue. There's also an example of unsuccessful genetic rescue. Um, so translocations have not been widely applied to conservation management, um, largely because of these remaining concerns. Uh, Amir, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, are there more examples of uh, genetic rescue in social animals? Uh, are there more examples of successful genetic rescue? Yes, in, in uh, social animals, because the wolves were like uh, sort of social animals. Oh, in social animals. Um, interesting question. I, well, uh, were actually, I don't know if it's successful yet long-term. So I work on um, Florida scrub jays that are cooperative breeders. Um, so offspring stay home and help their parents raise future, uh, raise future generations of offspring. So they're highly social. Um, and we have a ongoing project right now. So two, two, two years ago? Two years ago, we translocated um, like four to five individuals from one population into this uh, very tiny coastal population of jays. Um, this is a population on the East Coast where there's a lot of good habitat. It's unsaturated. Like there's more better habit, like more habitat than there are jays um, that can use it. And We've been monitoring that population so far, and we've seen kind of successful integration of the translocated individuals, and they've managed to su successfully breed in the population. One of our goals, right, because we don't know what the long-term effects are, we want to monitor this population for five or more years just to follow the kind of demographic and genetic impact of these um, immigrants. You're right that you know translocation can be a little tricky depending on kind of social structures and hierarchy. Um, and I would need to, I don't, I can't like immediately think of other examples off the top of my head right now. Um, but like in our case, we translocated, um, like an entire family group. Uh, so we did translate like socially dominant breeders. And I think that helped, but it's true that that's something that you would need to think about. Thank you. Were you worried about like translocated individuals being successful and accepted in the social hierarchy or were you thinking of something else? I, I was thinking about higher inbreeding within the family. Uh, uh, so oh, interesting. Um, right, because if there's more reproductive skew and your individual is really successful, then it might lead to higher inbreeding later. Um, yeah. I don't know that we know enough if that's going to be a generalizable pattern. So I think it also depends on just like how many like I think the Isle Royale population was small enough that you could have like one individual just like take over essentially. Um, I don't know how, I think it also depends on like the relative fitness of immigrant offspring versus resident offspring. Like that male was just like super successful and his offspring were also successful. Um, but you can imagine a case where one, if there were more, if there was more individuals who were reproducing, you wouldn't necessarily get that swamping effect as much. Um, and it also depends on the success of their offspring too, right? Because if their offspring or their grand offspring don't have high fitness, then um, you wouldn't see the same kind of phenomenon as what we saw in Isle Royale. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, great question. Um,
So there are a number of different concerns still with genetic rescue. <laughs> uh, one we haven't mentioned yet is like, one, it's possible that genetic rescue won't work at all uh, because of outbreeding depression. So outbreeding depression is the reduced fitness of hybrids um, because of maladaptation to the local environmental conditions and or genetic incompatibilities. Um, so this is more of a concern if uh, the source and recipient populations are really divergent and as that gives you like a greater chance of local adaptation. Um, but that's one of the questions, right? So if you are doing genetic, if you are thinking about using translocations for conservation, one of the really important questions is who do you move? What source population? And then which individuals from that source population? Another worry um, is genetic swamping or the loss of evolutionary lineages or locally adapted alleles due to gene flow. So this is even not, so the Isle Royale was kind of an extreme case of swamping where it was just one individual's alleles. Um, but there's also this kind of more general concern that gene flow homogenizes genetic variation across populations. Um, and that can reduce levels of genetic diversity for the species as a whole. So one kind of question is what are we trying to conserve and what at what scale, like how important are kind of uh, kind of if we have multiple populations, um, some of which are locally adapted, how important is it to preserve, you know, that genetic diversity in those separate populations? And like, how important is it to kind of maintain species level genetic diversity, or can we just, or do we just like keep numbers up? Anyways, so genomic tools um, can help you identify, you know, which populations might be in need of management. Um, it can also help you if you know something about kind of local adaptation or signatures of selection, then it can potentially help you identify source populations um, and also help you monitor changes in um, levels of genetic variation over time and also monitor the relative fitness of immigrants, residents, and hybrids um, to assess kind of how gene flow is actually happening in the population over time. All right, so just to wrap up today, we kind of talked about a hodgepodge of um, important concepts in conservation genetics and genomics, so different kind of ways of inferring population demography, um, heritability and genome-wide association studies, which are used to identify, um, which can be used to identify adaptive genetic variation. Um, and we talked a little bit about genetic rescue. And I think conservation genetics and genomics is like a growing burgeoning field that just involves a lot of like it's a fun field because it's highly interdisciplinary. Um, so, and I'm happy to provide kind of review papers and whatnot if you're interested in learning more. So that's all I had for today. Any questions? Okay, I think there are no questions, so we can wrap up. Yeah, so if there are no questions, my suggestions are either if everybody wants to go home early, that's fine, or um, we can go into breakout rooms and continue working. I don't know how uh, working on the problems that I gave you yesterday. Uh, maybe people want to raise their hands if they want to work on the problems. It might be that people are tired, though. If I yeah, I was like, as well, it's yeah. late. We've had a long day. How about raise your hand if you want to? Yeah, I guess raise or feel free to leave. 
if you're done for the day and I'll hang around for um, if anyone has questions. Okay, does anybody have questions from yesterday you'd like to clarify? I think in the meeting there were some que questions being discussed, but um, yesterday I don't remember. All right, I guess people are tired. Um, can call it a day um, and pick up, I guess, two days from now, um, Nancy, yeah. for the last lecture. Yeah, I think Thursday I'll just give like a I'll talk about some of the projects that we're working on. So it'll be more of a research talk. Sure, sounds great. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and good night, everybody. Uh, see you tomorrow. Bye. Good night. Thank you.